Thank you, everyone, and hello, hearty New Englanders. And for those of you who are joining us outside of New England, uh, rest assured your beloved Hingham is glistening in a, uh, a significant covering of snow. But I'm glad to see you all here today, which means we are have made it through to the other side. And three cheers for our friends at Hingham Municipal Light Plant, which uh, kept the kept the lights on so we can enjoy today's program. A few programming notes before we start today. I wanted to invite you all to join us on Saturday, February 19th, is the Hingham Historical Society's 45th Lincoln Day commemoration. Of course, our celebration commemorating that all Lincolns in America can claim Hingham as their ancestral home. For this year's Lincoln Day program on Saturday, February 19th, we welcome renowned Abraham Lincoln scholar Michael Burlingame. Michael taught at Connecticut College for many decades and now is an endowed chair at the University of Illinois Springfield. He will be joining us as our keynote address. On Lincoln Day, the militia muster at about 1015 and then the program begins at the Old Ship Meeting House at 11 a.m. We hope you can join us for this lovely Hingham tradition. On Sunday, February 27th, is our fourth lecture in the Out of the Box series, and Eileen will tell you more about that at the end of the program. And of course, every Thursday through Saturday throughout the month of February, we invite you to join us at the Hingham Heritage Museum for our latest exhibition, Polly Thayer Star, Nearer the Essence. It's a wonderful way to get out of the cold and into the sun and the warmth of Polly's beautiful artwork. So we hope you will come down and visit us. Thank you again for your support of the Hingham Historical Society and our Out of the Box Lecture Series. Enjoy the program. I'll turn it back to Eileen. Thank you, Deirdre. And let me add my welcome on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Hingham Historical Society and the Society's Education Committee. Our program today uses the topic of extreme weather to showcase how paper and digital archives help us to tell a story of past events shedding light not only on what happened, but on how people lived at the time. In addition to our society collections, today's program includes some references to other archives. I'm also very grateful for the additional weather stories shared with us by current Hingham residents to help us explore today's topic. So here's how our program is organized. I should have shown you the title page, sorry about that. But witnesses to extreme weather. Is, is the program that you've all tuned in for. Here's our, how our program is organized. I'm gonna begin by sharing some details about uh, stories and details about extreme weather events from the 18th through the 20th centuries that impacted Hingham and the South Shore. And then I will introduce our guest, meteorologist Michael Page of Hingham, and we'll have a conversation about this history as well as about weather prediction today. And after that, there will be time for some audience questions. We expect to conclude the program around 4.30 p.m. Um, and there will be an after Zoom program, which we'll talk about at the end. So before I begin, a heartfelt thank you to some of those who were so helpful as I researched Hingham's extreme weather history. Very special thanks in particular to Bob Malmy at the Hingham Historical Society for helping me access both paper and digital assets from the archives. And as you see here, also special thanks to Michael Achille at the library, to Jim Macedo of the Education Committee for going through microfiche of the Hingham Journal, uh, Frank Mellon and his Senior Center memoir writing class who brought us up to date with some of the recent stories. In the January 1997 issue of Yankee Magazine, writer William B. Meyer introduced a story by saying, bad weather is a fact of life in New England. To be remembered for long, it has to be bad indeed. He goes on to list some especially memorable weather events. For death and destruction at sea, there is the Portland Gale of 1898. For disruption of life on land, the blizzards of 1888 and 1978. For the most damage to property, the twin hurricanes of Connie and Diane in 1955. For overall harm, the hurricane of 1938, and for greatest loss of life, the heat wave of 1911. 
Well, with the exception of the blizzard of 1888, which actually did not impact Hingham, we are going to talk about all of these events this afternoon. Massachusetts Bay Colony Governor John Winthrop, writing in his journal on July 5th of 1643, reported a sudden gust in northeastern Massachusetts that downed multitudes of trees and lifted up a meeting house in Newbury. Some cite this diary entry as the first written documentation of an apparent tornado in Massachusetts. John Winthrop served multiple terms as the colonial governor between 1629 and 1648. He began his journal in 1630 at age 42. Today, the Massachusetts Historical Society considers Winthrop's diary, quote, the most important single manuscript held by the society, the basic document for the study of the history of the founding of Massachusetts. Well, diary writing was a well-established practice in colonial New England. The Massachusetts Historical Society has on microfilm 27, I'm sorry, 276 examples written by 112 individuals between 1635 and 1790. These diaries were kept by farmers, businessmen, clergy, soldiers, students, and physicians. References to severe weather in the late 18th century also turned up in the regular correspondence and journaling of John and Abigail Adams. In a January 1780 letter to her husband, Abigail Adams reported that, quote, in the latter part of December and the beginning of January, there fell the highest snow known since the year 1740. And during this time, she reported, people walked, rode, or sledded over the ice to Boston. John Adams, in the personal weather journal he was keeping that January, wrote that loads of wood, hay, and other items were conveyed on ox sleds from Weymouth, Braintree, and Dorchester Bay to Boston. It was also reported in a Boston newspaper at that time that during that winter, loads of wood were transported on the ice from Hingham to Hull. Well, personal weather journals, like that kept for a time by John Adams, were also not unusual. According to the National Weather Service, early weather record keepers in the Boston area included Paul Bradley, the Chief Justice of the Commonwealth, who kept records from 1738 to 1750, and Harvard professor John Winthrop, a descendant of the colonial governor we were just talking about by the same name. And that John Winthrop, the professor, recorded his weather observations for the years 1742 to 1748. Well, one early diary in our society archives from the 19th century suggests that daily notation of the weather was part of a morning routine for some. John Lane was deputy collector for the Port of Hingham from the time that Hingham first had a custom house in 1831 until he died in 1835. Now Hingham's custom house would be abolished in 1876. But John's diary and the excerpts shown here are from a few years before he took that custom house job. Each entry there begins with a brief weather report, which always notes the weather direction. I mean, I'm sorry, always notes the wind direction. So perhaps he has a weather vane or passes one on his way each morning. The society, Hingham Historical Society, has in, in its collection 22 journals. Most of these are from the 19th century. And today, the ones that I will cite today for their commentary on weather specifically are all written by men. Although we do have a handful of diaries written by women in our collection as well. There's definitely much work ahead for volunteers interested in scanning or describing these journals, but I'll be showing you some images I photographed with my phone of some of the journal pages. Hosea Sprague, a printer, author, and genealogist born in Hingham in 1779, kept a register of the weather for three years, 1835 to 1838. His data was published as a pamphlet in May of 1838. Well, there don't appear to be any severe storms on the dates that he chronicled, but they are fascinating for their seasonal observations, such as the dates in the spring when the wild geese came, or when dandelions appeared, or apple trees bloomed. George Lincoln, a passionate local historian and genealogist, kept a formal diary for many years and later 
annotated his farmer's almanac with detailed commentary on local events. He also pasted news clippings of interest into its pages. A large collection of his diaries, quite a treasure of local history, are in the archives of the Hingham Public Library. Here are some of his observations from 1872 and 1875 about what we would consider today severely cold winter weather, but which does not seem too worrisome to George at the time. So March 9th, 1872, ice between Hingham and Hull, two feet thick. Men walk to Pettix Island. And February 15th, a couple of years later, 1875, the clear cold weather continues wind west. The mercury in my thermometer at 7 a.m. stood just at zero, two below zero in many localities. Two men came from Hull Village on the ice today, having skated across in 35 minutes. I learned that Mr. John R. Brewer's men have cut ice for Mr. B today that measures 20 inches thick. It is very clear and transparent. Provincetown Harbor, as well as other ports on the south shore of Massachusetts Bay, is frozen over or filled with ice so that it is unnavigable. Fearing Bird Jr. was born in 1815 and following in his father's footsteps became a very well-known horticulturalist. Fearing kept a journal for several decades. One of the features in his journal is the date I'm going to show you here and I'll talk about in a second. As you might suspect, looking at it, Fearing had a fruit tree farm from which he harvested and sold peaches, apples, and plums, and he also raised strawberries. His daily diary is quite interesting. It includes a calendar of seasonal events, uh, which I've extracted here, associated with climate and weather. The table here is my transcription of one of these calendars. Here, Fearing notes, for example, the first snowstorm or when the steamship stopped service for the winter as well as the date when each type of fruit tree in his orchard first blooms. Fearing's diary over the years also describes the impact of a number of extreme weather events. And I'll be referencing a few examples as we go along. Well, as I read through weather observations of the past, it became apparent that severe weather was at sometimes good news for New Englanders. Heavy snowfall in times past presented the opportunity to use rollers to smooth the roads for transportation by sled. Snow rollers like the one shown here were in use in New England from roughly the 1880s through the 1930s. Traveling by sleigh over the smoothed snow was often preferable to using the uneven, rutted, sometimes very muddy roads during much of this period. Extreme cold weather also provided an opportunity for harvesting ice. Dallas Lore Sharp, who lived from 1870 to 1929, was a naturalist, a professor, and an author. He lived in Hingham while he taught English at Boston University. A copy of his beautifully written book, The Hills of Hingham, published in 1916, is in the Society Library. And in this chapter about harvesting ice, He's talking about harvesting 18 tons of ice for his private ice house. He writes, ice of the right quality and thickness with roads right and sky right for harvesting requires a conjunction of right conditions so difficult as to make a good ice day, ice day rare. This year it fell early in February. Down and down for three days slipped the silver column in the thermometer until at eight o'clock on the fourth day, it stood just above zero. Another day and night like this and the solid square edge blocks could come in. Sharp goes on to describe the hard work of harvesting ice, the tools, hired hands, a team of horses. The images on these next two slides show ice cutting in Hingham in 1898. And I will read how Dallas Sharp described his process in 1916. Quote, it was beautiful work. The mid-afternoon found us in the thick of a whirling storm. The grip of the snow relaxed, the woods abloom with the clinging snow, but the crop was nearly in. Higher and higher rose the cold blue cakes within the ice house doors until they touched the rafter plate. And these are just beautiful images from those days of ice houses in Hingham. 
Of course, extreme weather can cause much harm and the journals of Hingham residents make note of that as well. I was particularly struck by an entry in the diary of William Fearing Jr. William, born in 1832, like Fearing Burr, raised fruit and later was a longtime Hingham Town treasurer. William was only 17 when he wrote this in his diary in October, 1849. Quote, terrible storm, blowed all day like fury, blowed off most all our pears. Vessel went to pieces on Cuba Beach in Cohasset. Over 100 souls drowned, mostly women. Well, that 1849 entry took me back to research that I'd done for a program two years ago. And some of you will know the story of the Brig St. John, which in this storm was battered to pieces on the ledges off Cohasset. The ship was full of Irish immigrants fleeing the potato famine, including many women and some children. Only 11 passengers and nine crew were rescued. The scores of bodies which washed ashore were buried in a common grave at Cohasset Central Cemetery where a large stone Celtic cross was erected in their memory. Cohasset is well known for another storm along its coastline in the 19th century. First, let's look at some quick background concerning the Minot's Ledge Light. And this background comes from an entry in the Society's Out of the Archives blog uh, that was written in 2014. Quote, between 1832 and 1841, 40 vessels foundered on the rocks at Minot's Ledge off Cohasset and Situate. And in the late 1840s, a lighthouse was built on the ledge. It was lit for the first time on January 1st, 1850. In his book, Cape Cod, Henry David Thoreau had described passing the almost completed Minot's Ledge light in 1849. Here was the new iron lighthouse in the shape of an eggshell painted red and placed high on iron pillars, like the ovum of a sea monster floating on the waves. Well, the Society blog about the lighthouse was inspired by an artifact in our collections from the, 18, from the April 1851 Minot's Light Storm. The blog post said, a fierce nor'easter hit Cape Cod Bay on April 16th, 1851, bringing with it the highest seas ever recorded to that time. The lighthouse was manned that night by the lighthouse keeper's two young assistants, Joseph Wilson and Joseph Antoine. They kept the light burning into the night. At some point in the evening, Antoine and Wilson placed a note in a bottle and dropped it into the waves below. The note was found the following day by a Gloucester fisherman and it read, the lighthouse won't stand over tonight. She shakes two feet each way now, and it's signed with their initials, JW and JA. Well, they were correct. Minot's light and these two young men did not survive the night. The note from the bottle was donated to the Hingham Historical Society in the 1920s by a local historian from Gloucester. We also have a real-time description of the storm from the diary of Fearing Burr. He wrote on April 15, 1851, about a severe storm, wind, and high tides. And the next day, April 16th, he says, went to Boston. He was selling potatoes that day. During the night, the storm has been increasing, and the tide one of the most remarkable. The wind blew almost a hurricane. The tide flowed up and around Fennel Hall and was deep in front of our store. Boats and rafts navigated the streets. And the following day he wrote, during the night, Minot's ledge light was carried away and the lives of both the keepers lost. He adds, the old colony railroad has sustained damage estimated at 20 to $30,000. Well, after the destruction of this lighthouse, a series of light ships offered protection along the coastline where these ledges are for several years. And then a replacement lighthouse was built, this time with blocks of Quincy granite. That began operating on November 15, 1860. And in 1894, the original lantern there was replaced by the beacon that flashes one, four, three. As many of you know, that's been interpreted by locals and fans of the lighthouse as I love you. 
Well, when I perused some of Fearing Burr's later diary entries, I was pleased to find his description of a peculiar atmospheric event that I had seen referenced in Sidney Purley's 1891 book, Historic Storms of New England. Here is how Purley began his chapter about the yellow day of 1881. On Tuesday, September 6, 1881, occurred a darkness which overspread New England almost all day. It was similar to the famous dark day of 1780, but on account of the intense grassy appearance, which everything assumed, it will go down in history as the yellow day. Well, here is how Fearing Burr described that day in Hingham in his diary. A remarkable day, the sun was just visible through the smoky, murky atmosphere, and the color of natural objects became greatly changed. The phenomenon continued through the day, becoming more marked and striking as the day drew to its close. Yellow became white, and white a reddish salmon color, green and bluish tinge, and foliage was everywhere, especially soft and beautiful. The darkness increased and the cordage factory was obliged to dismiss its workmen and close early. Well, I discovered thanks to Paula Bagger that the society collections also include this painting of the yellow day of 1881 by Hingham artist Franklin Whiting Rogers, who lived from 1854 to 1917. Franklin painted from his studio and home on Free Street for most of his long professional career as an artist. On the left, you see that he carved the painting's title, Yellow Day, Hingham, Massachusetts, and his name into the back of the painting's frame. And you can take a look at this painting when you come into the museum. You'll have to ask someone to guide you to it because we have it hanging on the wall in the archives. Now to the Portland Gale. The Portland, a side paddle wheel steamship built in 1889, offered overnight passage between Boston and Portland, Maine. As soon as it left India Wharf in Boston at 7.07 .07 p.m. on November 26, 1898, the Portland ran into fierce weather. A monster nor'easter created off the coast of Virginia had traveled up the coast, and the Portland, caught up in the storm, sank off Cape Cod. None of the 192 passengers and crew survived. This storm had been forecast by the Weather Service, which was in operation in those days, but according to some stories about the disaster, the Portland's captain had been ordered to make the scheduled trip, in part due to the growing competition steamships were facing from the railroad. Overall, the Portland Gale took more than 400 lives and sank more than 100 boats and ships. The storm also changed the course of the North River separating the Hummerock portion of Situate from the rest of the town. Well, George Lincoln's diary entry for November 27, 1889 said about the Portland Gale, the tide came into the harbor in great rollers, rough and discolored, extending up over the wharves, the streets and meadows. Every boat at her moorings was sunk or driven up on the beach and the lumber on Wilder's, Kimball's and Whitney's wharves was scattered about the harbor, presenting a scene of devastation the like of which has not been seen since the great gale of April 16th, 1851. And he's of course referring back to the minus light storm. As described in the book, the 1993 Hingham History, Not All Has Changed, the Portland gale also wrecked havoc throughout town. Quote, fallen and uprooted trees and broken poles lay crisscrossed everywhere. The Portland Gale had another impact here in Hingham. The Nantasket Beach Steamboat Company decided not to rebuild the wharf that was destroyed in that storm, and direct steamboat service to and from Hingham ended for good. James Kimball, born in Wollaston in 1880, lived most of his life in Hingham, where he died in 1964. James was the manager of the lumber company started by his father, George Kimball, located at Hingham Harbor. James wrote in his diary about the two-day storm of heavy snow and gale force winds, later to be called the Christmas blizzard of 1909. He writes on December 26th, 
hard snowstorm from the Northeast all day, all wires down and nothing moving. And the next day he says, everything blocked up, poles and wires down all along the line. All bathhouses washed away on Otis Street. Lots of Whitney's lumber washed overboard, heavy damage at the beach. Well, James Kimball also provides a Hingham view of the historic heat wave of July 1911. On July 2nd, he says, fair and very hot. Glass is 96 degrees. And he mentions that he had a swim in the afternoon. And the diary for that day suggests that he and his wife, B had continued their planned activities through the day. On July 3rd, he says, good hot day, quite busy at the wharf. And on July 4th, very hot. And he then documents a full day of festive activities for the 4th of July. Parade at eight, umpired ball games in AM and PM, fireworks and band concert in the evening. And he adds a big crowd out. And July 5th, fair and still very hot, quite busy at the wharf. He then repeats very hot and says he stayed home in the evening and went to bed early. Well, that's not surprising because here's how the July 7th issue of the Hingham Journal described the consecutive days of extreme heat. For five consecutive days, the temperature soared up into the 90s and even to the hundreds. And the highest reliable recorded temperature was 104 degrees on the 5th of July. People groaned and tried to keep cool, but it was of no use. While there were no direct prostrations, there were many who came perilously near, particularly during the celebration of the 4th at the games on the agricultural grounds. It was most fortunate that Dr. Whalen was present and was able to give first aid. The reporter went on to say that when the heat broke, there was a violent thunderstorm and lightning damaged the chimney of Mrs. William O. Lincoln on South Street and struck and killed a cow on the Winquist Farm on High Street. The paper also announced the cancellation due to the extreme heat of the July meeting of the old colony chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, which was to have been hosted by the wife of Peter Bradley, the prominent businessman and breeder of Arabian horses in Hingham, who some of you have heard about. Now we'll jump forward a couple of decades to September 21st, 1938, and the storm about which it is often said, no one saw it coming. And this image from the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society symbolizes the destructive power and tragic consequences of the storm. And you can see the caption on this slide says it was a house from Gray Gables, Massachusetts that floated to the Cape Canal Bridge with five lives lost. Here in Hingham, residents were definitely caught by surprise. Former Hingham Fire Chief Mark Duff shared a story told to him by his dad Valentine Duff, known as Val. Val was then serving as executive health officer for Hingham, and he was driving back from Brockton where he had gone to test milk samples from the town dairies. He had no reason to suspect that a storm was brewing. As he drove through Queen Anne's Corner, he recalled, the sun was out. But when he arrived at his office in downtown Hingham at 14 Main Street, Val told son Mark, we were in a hurricane. Indeed, that would seem to be the case. As related in Not All Has Changed, winds gusting over 100 miles an hour lifted the slates from St. Paul's steeple, sliced off roofs on Crow Point, toppled a thousand trees. On Main Street, the roots of many elm trees made craters as they tore up sidewalks. The town was in darkness. Miraculously, no human lives were lost in Hingham. As Mark Duff pointed out when we talked, this was at a time before portable gasoline powered chainsaws were available. It was only after World War II that improvements in aluminum and engine design of chainsaws allowed for one person operation. Imagine the work of cleanup when most fallen trees had to be cut up with axes and manual hand saws. Well, Hingham resident Jean Haviland was a six year old and lived in Graintree at the time of the 1938 storm. In the Hingham Senior Center memoir writing class, she recently wrote about her 
1938 experience, saying in part, damage was unbelievable. Trees uprooted all over the town, and especially a couple of big ones down across Dickerman Lane, a dead-end dirt road with four houses, ours being the last one. I remember my father and a couple of neighbors out there with two-man manual saws trying to clear the street so that we could get out to the rest of the town. Jean continues, we had no power for at least a couple of weeks. But fortunately, we had an old black cast iron kitchen cook stove that was fueled by kerosene so we could cook. But everything after dark had to be done by oil lamps. The 1938 storm caused considerable flooding and property damage throughout Hingham. These two images show the flooding on Free Street, likely near where the Crooked Meadow River flows into the Weir River. Well, I was able to locate these print photos in our archives and connect them with the 1938 storm thanks to the hard work of volunteers over decades. What you see here on the left is an archival box for photos full of labeled envelopes with numbers corresponding to a digital database. So we can look up a topic and find a number that corresponds to a box with numbered envelopes that also include, as you see here, a description of the contents. This is important work that makes history accessible. Turning to the 1950s, they were notable for the hurricanes hitting New England in both 1954 and 1955. First, there was Hurricane Carol at the end of August in 1954. The storm had sustained winds of 130 to 160 miles per hour over eastern Connecticut, Rhode Island, and eastern Massachusetts. Fan Leonard, who still lives in the Glad Tidings Plain neighborhood of Hingham, shared her memory of the storm with me. Quote, I remember that a policeman came to the house and warned us that we might have to be evacuated. The dam at Cushing Pond was threatened. And we live close to where the stream comes from Cushing Pond and passes under Main Street. Of course, the first thing we did was to jump into the car and drive over the mill lane to see it happening. The dam itself was sturdy, but the supporting soil was starting to go. It did hold, after all, but a mighty light lot of water got through. If you stand at the bridge today opposite the Cracker Barrel and look down at that innocent little stream, it's a drop of seven or eight feet. But that day, passing cars were splashing through water that was over the hubcaps. Jane Allen, whose house abuts the stream, had six feet of water in her cellar. And the Lords next to her took a picture of Thatcher Lord, who was maybe 10 at the time, paddling a canoe over the tennis court. When Hurricane Carol hit in late August that year, Don Lincoln was about to begin his senior year at Hingham High, but due to the storm, school opening was delayed for a week. Don was hired by the highway department to take calls from those needing help, and then by one of the contractors to help with the removal of damaged trees. He recalled that many trees were down. The South Pleasant and Charles Street areas, he said, were especially hard hit. And Don has a vivid memory of many spruce trees that had to be cut and burned. A major tree burning location, he said, was where the driving range on Union Street is now. Don also recalled that utility crews from Niagara Mohawk came to Hingham to help repair and replace electric lines. Well, be before I share more about the 1950s hurricanes, I need to tell you about the extraordinary Bob Skilling. In this clipping from the Boston Globe, you see a photo from 2015, where Bob on the right was honored by the National Weather Service for his then only 55 years as a volunteer weather observer. But back in the 1950s, Bob was a student at Hingham High, from which he would graduate in 1956. Bob had started keeping a detailed weather journal using instruments that he purchased and installed at the family's home in Hingham in 1953. He'd also started a scrapbook devoted to weather events. Here is Bob today with some of his weather measurement equipment. Amazingly, as he approaches his 84th birthday, 
He still records and reports daily and now using equipment provided by the Weather Bureau as well as his own equipment. He uses the Weather app, the Weather Service app on his computer to do this reporting, all from his Hingham Weather Station. So now that we know a little bit about Bob Skillen, let's go back to Hurricane Carol in 1954. This is a news clipping from Bob Skilling's 1950s weather scrapbook, and he pasted it carefully into the book, which is why you see the reflection on this page. This is among the materials that Bob has donated to the society. And the news photo here shows boats hurled onto the rocks in situate by Hurricane Carol. And here's another clipping from Bob's scrapbook of Hurricane Carol, in this case, showing damage to a church in Weymouth. Well, in the summer of 1955, just ahead of Bob Skilling's senior year at Hingham High, and this is his Hingham High yearbook photo, Bob was monitoring the weather closely as Hurricane Diane moved up the coast just days after Hurricane Connie had delivered four to six inches of rain to New England. This is Bob's notebook from a few days that August. First on this slide, he's making note of the hurricane's movement up the coast on August 15th. And I've highlighted that text on the slide on the left, Hurricane Diane on the move. And here a few days later, Bob assessed the impact of the storm. He reported that 14.67 inches of rain had fallen in Hingham just from August 17th to August 19th. And as the ground was already saturated from Hurricane Connie, he comments, there was heavy flooding everywhere. Well, don't think you'll be surprised that when Bob entered his weather journal into the South Shore Area High School Science Fair, he was honored with the top prize. But of even greater significance, these high school weather journals were instrumental in 1960 in qualifying Bob to become an observer for the National Weather Service, and also in getting Bob first a part-time job, but one that would become a full-time career as observer-in-chief at the Blue Hill Observatory. And now this Skilling Weather Journal is part of the collection of journals over the centuries at the Hingham Historical Society. Thank you very much, Bob. The blizzard of 78, which we've been hearing a lot about in the news for comparison this weekend, arrived on the morning of February 6th, bringing with it hurricane force winds, flood tides up to 12 feet, and more than two feet of snow, with drifts as high as 15 feet. For a time, Hull became a series of islands, and many houses along the Hull and Situate coastline were washed away. These next few slides that I'll click through, you'll see show flooding and collapsed homes in Hull. And I thank Chris Harridan of Hull for sharing his collection of the Blizzard of 78 photos for this program. And here are images that ran in an issue of South Shore News, which doesn't exist anymore. This was the week after the 1978 storm. On the left is a photo of the damage the blizzard left at Peggotty Beach in Situate. And on the right is a photo of roughly the same location that the newspaper had pulled for comparison from its archives of the devastating Portland Gale eight years earlier in 1898. Well, it was fitting as it turned out that the movie scheduled for Loring Hall when the blizzard hit in 1978, as shown on the marquee in these images was, oh God. In its report for the year, the Hingham Board of Selectmen highlighted the impact of the storm as follows. Quote, on January 20th, the town encountered its first major storm with an accumulation of over three feet of snow. A rapidly approaching normalcy, we were then greeted by the now famous 78 blizzard on February 6th. Accompanied by hurricane winds, this storm blanketed the town with another 40 inches of new snow. Mark Duff, who was then a Hingham firefighter, had come on duty at 4.30 that first morning of the storm and was among those who had worked for more than 24 hours. 
Mark recalls helping to remove a VW from the floodwaters in which it was floating at Kilby and Rockland Streets, and also encountering two feet of water, both at West Corner and Hingham Rotary. He helped rescue a woman trapped when waters rose on Steamboat Lane, and he saw homes washed out to sea in Hull. The storm had arrived a bit later than forecast, and most commuters had not heeded the warnings when they headed to work that morning. When they attempted to return home during the storm, an estimated 3,000 cars and 500 trucks were immobilized along an eight-mile stretch of Route 128. Hingham's Dottie Snowden shared this memory of her late husband Al's role during the 1978 storm. The National Guard was needed to clear roads. As the officer in charge of the operational maintenance shop motor pool, it was essential that Al reach Quincy to direct operations. Snow came down all day Monday and Tuesday, which made roads impassable for cars. He trudged from Hingham to Quincy through the snow and stayed at the armory for a week. A canteen truck brought food and he slept in the cab of an army truck. Louise Smith recalled, our son sat atop a snow pile as high as the Lincoln Street sign. For a week, North Street was closed to traffic except for National Guard trucks trundling snow to the harbor. In the road, people walked and cross-country skied to the square, not that many businesses were open, but just for the fun of it. It was so quiet. And Judith Griffin, who lived in Norwell at the time, shared this memory of coping without power. We had no power for more than a week afterward. In our den, there was a big, wide open fireplace with an iron rod that held a large antique pot. And all during the time with no power, I cooked everything I could find in the pantry, the fridge, and the freezer to make our meals in that pot hanging over the fire in the fireplace. It was maybe Thursday that I remember we were able to walk single file on Route 53 to the store market that had reopened at Queen Anne's Corner. The two more quick stories told to me by Hingham residents about the 78 storm. Pat Branahan, then living on Croydon Road, told me that during the storm, a small dog showed up at their house, appearing to be a bit trapped by all the snow. They took the dog in and would run an ad in the paper, but the owner was not found. So they adopted the dog and named it Bajo, which in Spanish means low, because the dog, a mixed corgi, she believes, was so low to the ground. The dog became part of the family for many years. And it is to Pat Granahan's credit that she recalls this upbeat story as she was at home with seven children at the time that the storm struck. Her husband had been out of town on business. Well, Ann Overbeck was in her home on Martin's Lane, caring for a newborn, her two-week-old baby boy, who had developed an upper respiratory infection, as well as two active toddler sons. Fortunately, the phone lines had not been damaged. Ann credits her pediatrician, Dr. Eldridge of Hingham Center, with getting her newborn through the ordeal as he guided her in caring for the sick infant via frequent phone calls throughout the raging storm. Meanwhile, Anne's husband, Jim, attempting to return home by bus from Boston, got only as far as St. Jerome's Church in Weymouth, which had been pressed into service as a storm shelter. Jim was worried about Anne at home alone with the infant and two young boys, so he walked home almost four miles through the blizzard from St. Jerome's in Weymouth. Anne recalls that Jim said it was a long walk and he was grateful to make it home. Well, before I introduce our guest, a few historic notes about weather forecasting. Well before the advent of an official weather bureau, in 1792, the first issue of the Farmer's Almanac was published. The Almanac continued publishing until 1846. In 1848, and you see that highlighted here, the Smithsonian Institution, then only two years old, may have been seeking to establish credibility for itself as a national education organization when they distributed weather monitoring equipment to 150 volunteer observers across the country. Their localized daily reports were sent in by telegraph 
and the Smithsonian then generated a national weather map that it displayed on the National Mall. The map became a popular tourist attraction. In time, the number of volunteers grew to 600. And later, this observer corps became part of the government's weather bureau. Advances in forecasting technology like radar and satellite images, you see that in the middle column here highlighted, did not come along until the 20th century. And even then, as we saw with the blizzard of 78, forecasts were too easily dismissed. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Hingham resident, Michael Page. Some of you know Michael from his involvement with Hingham Jewelers, a now multi-generational family business, but he is with us today as a meteorologist. Michael has been a certified broadcast meteorologist in New England for nearly 10 years. He received his BS in meteorology and weather forecasting and communications from Penn State University. His forecasts appear locally in the Hingham Anchor, although he was also on Fox News locally last night. And while Hingham Jewelers is his day job now, he still appears when needed to help cover important New England storms, uh, especially for the Weather Channel. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Well, after, my, after my conversation with Michael, just want everyone to know we will open it up for audience questions. But uh, so great to have you with us today, Michael, especially after yesterday's storm. Oh, this is like a perfect tee up between the storm <laughs> yesterday. Great for your presentation. And I'm excited to dive into the questions now. Great. Well, just uh, out of curiosity, what got you interested in studying meteorology? So very much like Bob Skilling and so many other budding weather enthusiasts, it starts with observation. You start writing down little notes. And it was storms like yesterday, honestly, that got me really into it. Big snowstorms. It's fun. I mean, you turn into like a little kid again, especially when you have that much snow and not so much the power outage issue. Like yesterday was a classic case where I'm sure there are kids in Hingham who are now are much more interested in meteorology and maybe thinking about weather because it just really sparks some excitement in you that doesn't die. I'm still just as excited all these years later. So when I was in middle school, I started writing down uh, journals very much like Bob before school, after school, and a couple of the TV stations at the time, this was well before social media, of course, were asking for snow totals, you know, how much snow is in your backyard. So as I would jot my notes down, I would go, you know, measure and call it in and have conversations with the TV meteorologists at the time. And that also was exciting as a middle schooler to talk to these people who you're seeing on TV and they're mentioning your name on TV. And it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is kind of cool. So continue to do that, if nothing else, for like the shallow recognition that you get on television and having access to these people. But at the same time, you're also getting more and more interested in the science and they're helping to guide you through that, not just in the observation part of it, but in the actual forecasting. So by high school, in talking to some of those meteorologists on TV, they would recommend books that I could read. And again, it's not like the internet wasn't in existence at this point, but it just wasn't quite as accessible. It was still kind of clunky. So books were actually still the easiest way to go for something this specialized. And once I got some of the forecasting chops through these books, I was like, okay, well, this is fun too. I want to share more of my observations. Now I want to start forecasting and I like talking about the weather. So I started a website, hingamweather.com, which I ran all through high school, through college, and a shocking number of people actually read it, maybe some people on this call. And I do appreciate that because that adds some level of accountability when you're learning to forecast. You know, it's one thing if you're just forecasting for yourself, but if you're actually putting the forecast out there and you feel like people are making decisions based on it and then you're right, it feels great. If you're wrong, you know, there are consequences to that. You don't wanna be wrong. This is like your name, your reputation, like anyone's job. You never wanna be wrong or mess up in front of your boss. And for me, the boss is the public. You know, it's that um, real feeling of wanting to excel and have people feel like you're good at what you do. So after that, I was like, wow, I really do like this forecasting, communicating, thought about college, went to Penn State, got to do some TV there, which was fantastic. And TV is the best platform for communicating with people, at least when I was 
going into college. So while I was at school, I was like, well, I guess I should make sure that TV is really what I want to do. And I had a two-year internship at Channel 5 with Harvey Leonard uh, in Boston, which was incredible, as you would expect. And sure enough, I was like, yeah, great. This sounds wonderful. So kept doing TV in college and then got my first TV job in Burlington, Vermont. I was up there for two years. Very lucky to start in New England. I'm like a New Englander through and through. So I was psyched I was able to start there and not in some somewhat remote part of middle America that didn't have much interest to me or no personal connection. You know, this is where my family is, my friends are, want to be home. And then my long-term career career goal was always to be on TV in Boston. And I was very lucky that at 24, I got hired at NECN and NBC Boston here. And I was there for five years. And then just recently during the pandemic, I was like, okay, thought that was going to be my long-term goal, but I kind of did that. So uh, that's why I'm now involved in the family business on a day-to-day basis. So I get a little bit more of a personal life without the hours. But as you said, I mean, still very much involved um, with the Weather Channel, Fox Weather when necessary, filling in locally. So now it's just kind of more back to like a on the side when I can dip my toe in and have fun again. So you were talking about getting interested as an observer and documenting things and, and mentioning Bob Skilling. Clearly in the diaries that we've reviewed, there was a lot of observation of weather and seasonality uh, that people wrote about in their diaries. What do you th- think today about the you know average uh, person, you know viewer, listener, uh, someone who follows your information about our observation skills compared to perhaps days when we you know might worry about our fruit trees? It's very different. So those diary entries that you were showing are fascinating because weather in the 1800s, the early 1900s, really was life and death, much more so than it is today life and death, not just literally from the weather, but in terms of being able to provide food for your family or your job may depend on the weather, whether it is ice or shipping or what have you. Now our technological advances have made weather not completely easygoing in terms of limiting life-threatening things like that, but it makes life easier. Even something like heat, you talked about 1911, we have air conditioning now. You know, so in that age, sleeping at night was dangerous because your body could overheat. Now, many of us have the benefit of air conditioning. So technology, just in terms of actual innovation has helped, but our forecasting is much better so we can prepare. So as a result, when people are observing the weather now, it's much more casual. Again, back then, because it was so critical, you get very detailed reports about the wind direction, how it felt, you know, was the air dry? Was it muggy. But today, it's much more of just usually people talking about it in terms of being an inconvenience or being really dramatic or something and posting on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. It's not a very detailed, the wind is coming out of the Northwest and then it suddenly shifted at 310 in the afternoon to a southerly wind. It's like, oh yeah, it was windy today and it got colder tonight. You know, it's much more casual now because people do have technology on their phone. When you want to know the temperature, you don't have to go walk to your thermometer like you had to decades ago, now people just open up their phone. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that phone is not physically taking the temperature right where you are, it's taking it from somewhere nearby, but there can be huge variation from where this computer is taking information and where you're actually living. But a lot of people just kind of take that as gospel for where they are. So Mm. people were much more intimate with the weather, I'll say, with those diary entries and people like Bob Skilling or myself when I was writing it down, you know, when you do it by hand and you're writing down those specifics, it's there's something special about it, much more so than just tapping the weather app on your phone and seeing what the computer tells you. You know, it's really getting away from just staring at your phone and seeing what technology says versus actually like looking at the sky and like, what is the weather telling you? You know, like what what is the sky telling you? Looking up still has a lot of power. Right. Well, speaking of looking up and describing the sky, the Fearing Burr entry about the Yellow Day of 1881, I just found almost poetic, but really striking in the, in the descriptive uh, language that he used. Uh, just interesting as an atmospheric event, when you go back in time, and they also mentioned an 18th century event that must have been really frightening to people, uh, these dark days or the Yellow Day. Uh, can, can you bring us up to date on how we detect these kinds of things and what the sources are? I did do some reading on the sources of those, but at the time, they must have been really scary to people. Well, and this goes back to our improved technology and understanding. So again, back then, 
you look up in the sky and it's like, what is this apocalyptic looking thing? You know, you just, you don't understand. Turns out it was from wildfires and burning in other parts of the country. But how would you ever know that here without the benefit of satellites? Now we have the same thing happening. In fact, it happened a couple of times this summer. You look up and the sky gets that milky appearance. Arguably it wasn't as dramatic as what was described there in the historical record, but you could tell there was like this film and haze and it even smelled a little smoky at mm -hmm. times. But now we have the benefit of satellites where we can physically see the wildfires in California or Montana or Southern Canada generating this impressive plume of smoke and we can see it following the jet stream, the prevailing winds across the country, even if it's dipping way to the south and then bending up towards us, we can watch it right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. We know exactly what it is. We know exactly when it's going to happen. But back then, you don't have that eye in the sky. Satellite really is so incredibly beneficial for things like that or the 1938 hurricane, which, as you said, was very much a surprise because no one saw it coming. Now, with the benefit of satellite, this gets back to my point of weather is a little bit more seen as an inconvenience now as much as life threatening because you feel like you have this constant friend over the top of you like keeping an eye on things so people forget that these weather events still are very significant because you know you kind of have that like cloak of safety just feeling like oh we understand everything we can see where everything's coming from so there's that risk of people feeling a little too comfortable with our technology when in reality it's really awesome and it helps but it's still not perfect and the 38 storm they were expecting it was going to go out to sea and they just didn't have satellites to see it turn in? Is that more or less what happened? As yeah, there was a ship off the coastline that called it in to the Weather Bureau at the time. They said, hey, we're in this big storm. We didn't really see it or we weren't really expecting it. And the meteorologist on land said, well, I mean, okay, these things usually curve out to sea yeah. with a gain in latitude. So as it comes up the coastline, it usually curves out to sea. Problem is this storm was going so fast, 60 mm -hmm. miles an hour instead of the usual 20 miles an hour. So it's kind of like when you're trying to get off an exit, you know, you, you slow down getting off the exit ramp so you can make the curve. You know, it would be like if getting off the exit ramp at 60, you're gonna fly right off the ramp. You're not gonna make the turn, didn't make the turn. But we didn't know it wasn't making the turn until it's knocking on your doorstep and suddenly you have a major category three hurricane ripping in. So there was no eye in the sky after that ship said, it's out here, okay, most storms curve, but it didn't curve. So we have eyes in the sky now, but what, what storms are the toughest to, to really figure out and forecast well? So we'll use this weekend as an example in just a minute, but still overall, our biggest blind spot in terms of technology and where weather really is still very, very life-threatening is severe weather, tornadoes, things like that. Because we still don't really know why some thunderstorms produce tornadoes. We certainly don't have a lot of advanced warning when that's gonna happen. 10, 20 minutes. I mean, it's just not mm. enough time when you think about it. So those really short fuse weather events, mesoscale is what we call them, very small scale. We're still not great at that. That's one huge blind spot that we have. But even a storm like this, you know, it's really fascinating because five, six days ago, it was very clear that the ingredients were going to be there for a significant storm. And all week, it pretty much looked like a slam dunk that this was going to be a big one for us. So on one hand, that's incredible technology that five to six days ahead of a historic blizzard, we know it's going to happen. Now, the problem is <laughs> the technology is good enough for that, but it's not good enough for specifics still until two days away. And this is where the public thinks we're better than we are <laughs> in terms of meteorologists. So people are expecting on Monday, okay, you can tell me there's a big storm. Well, how much snow is gonna fall? And like the reality is the storm didn't even form until Wednesday. We had nothing even on the map to look at. It's energy that you can't even see with your eyes. It's just out there that we're observing the energy in the atmosphere that we know is going to come together, but there's really nothing to track until Wednesday that's when we can finally see the details of the storm come into light. So technology is like a little bit of a double-edged sword. You know, it's, it's great that you can see it, but then people expect you to be able to produce those details that far in advance, and you just can't. I would argue that this is also where we've given people the opportunity to expect too much from us. So this storm, again, coming back to it, we knew it was going to produce one to two feet of snow the number of people who are like, well, one station says we're going to get 18 inches, one says 20, one says 15. It does not matter. <laughs> the message should be the same, that it's going to be an all-day snowstorm. Everything will be shut down. You shouldn't be going anywhere. That's the message. That's how you should prepare. 
doesn't matter if you get 15 or 20 inches. I would guarantee that most people on this call could not tell me how much snow is in their backyard. Someone like Bob or myself was out there very diligently measuring properly and getting the right average and things. So we do have a sense of what fell, but it's just so hard to get that specific, even though people seem to want it for whatever reason, when in reality, in terms of your preparation, it should be big picture. So, you know, again, this storm, we were lucky. We didn't think there would be big power outages because it was fluffy snow, because there are no leaves on the trees. There was no big coastal flood threat with this. So we kind of knew it was just gonna be a good old fashioned blizzard with a snow day, prepare to hunker down, make sure you have gas for the snow blower, your car, have enough food for the day, that type of stuff. So this is where the world of instant gratification and people just assuming that they can get all the answers they want immediately collides with weather and it's just not the reality yet. You mentioned some, some good advice uh, really on uh, preparation for storms, but you th are there like seasonal preparations like everyday types of preparations that we are not doing the way they used to do perhaps? Yeah, so this comes back to my overarching feeling that in the 1800s, early 1900s, people were very intimately connected to the weather. They understood the weather. They could read the signs of the weather because they were out in it. Their lives, their livelihoods, it all depended on it. And it was up to them. They didn't have meteorologists on TV or from the government paying attention for them. You know, it was really incumbent upon every man for himself or herself. Now, again, with this weather app on everyone's phone, there's this sense of complacency that you can see the weather happening we know what's going to happen and that we'll just always be able to get through it but when it comes to a hurricane or a blizzard and i would argue a blizzard more significant than this because even though it was a lot of snow like it's not like 78 there were there was no dramatic coastal flooding there was no real damage around here or anything like that you know people have to be prepared for these things even this week on Wednesday, I was going out to fill up my gas and I tweeted that and like I was tweeting that I was preparing people were like, oh, it's Wednesday, you've still got time. And it's like, well, you need to make sure that you have the supplies that you need for whatever is going to happen. Same thing with a hurricane. We might have a sense that there's going to be a hurricane, for example, five to six days away. If there's a chance that something could happen, you should be preparing and making sure that you have batteries and water and food and all the things that you would need to get through that situation. There's a little bit of a feeling of over dependence, I think that a technology will guide them through the storm and get them through whatever they want. But remember, if we lose power, you lose all of your technology. And I think the pandemic has been a reminder or should be a reminder that natural phenomena like a pandemic, like weather, sometimes you are fending for yourself. You know, we have society that has really great resources and, you know, we have great emergency responders and hospitals and things like that. But again, just like the pandemic, we just have to remember these things are vulnerable and we can't take them for granted. So when it is the start of hurricane season, when we're going into the storm season, think about what your house would need to get through without power, without having a working refrigerator or something like that. Would you have food that you could eat if your fridge goes down in a hurricane for a couple of days in the summer? You know, this time of year, you just stick it out in the snow and you're fine. But, um, you know, these are the things that sometimes people aren't, aren't thinking about right now because we're very much a technological instant gratification type world. And you'd really do still have to go back to kind of the basics of those 1800s, early 1900s when, and I hate to say survival of the fittest, but you know, people understood a lot more about nature then than they do now. We're not spending as much time outside and you know, we're not as, as fine tuned in terms of what it all means for us. Yeah, so you've been talking about technology in different ways. Just in your career in meteorology, what have you seen in terms of advances in technology that have really improved forecasting? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's getting better and better all the time. So one thing is it's called dual polarization radar. So, you know, weather radar is what's telling us where it's raining, where it's snowing. Now this technology can also tell us the shape of what's falling from the sky. Is it all the same shape? Is it different shape? That means we can tell where there's hail, where a tornado may be lofting debris in the sky. So that's really helpful in those short fuse events I was talking about, like tornadoes, like severe thunderstorms. Satellites, of course, have gotten better and better, higher resolution, so we can see with greater detail these storms. We have more observations around the country, globally, over the ocean, taking current weather information and then putting that into supercomputers to generate these computer models that we're relying on. The more good information we have to put into that model, the better it's going to be. Going back to this blizzard, the reason we don't have that data, remember, there's no storm on the weather map until Wednesday. Well, part of the reason we don't have much information is because the energy from that storm was still over the Pacific. 
There's not a whole lot of people over the Pacific telling us what's going on there. So we have to wait for it to hit the United States where we get good sampling. And then with this storm, we actually additionally flew hurricane hunters. And I say we, I'm just talking about like the weather community in general, flew hurricane hunters into the storm, just like we would sample with a hurricane to get even more observations that gets fed into these supercomputers. And the computers themselves are getting better, just like the computers we use at home. These things are crunching so many numbers in such a short period of time that we get higher resolution computer models that go farther out. So, you know, when I was a kid, it was a four or five day forecast on TV, for example. I did a seven day forecast in Vermont. By the time I was wrapping up in Boston, we were doing a 10 day forecast. Now, would I tell you to take day 10? Literally, <laughs> no, <laughs> but you know, we could show you a trend. Is it gonna be really hot? Is it gonna be near average? Is it gonna be below average? Is there a possibility of a storm? It's a good like general guide. Again, if people are using it just as that, a guide and as a use to prepare for a range of outcomes. That's the key. People still have to look at the forecast and realize even if we tell you we expect 14 or 15 inches of snow, prepare to get a foot, prepare to get a little bit more than that. You know, weather is really a range of potential outcomes. So when we're giving you a forecast, you kind of have to build that in, in terms of how you're going to prepare yourself, your family, you know, if you're commuting and the snow is supposed to start at 10. Well, I wouldn't take that literally, you know, give yourself a little buffer, just know, okay, I should travel as early as possible in the morning, because as we get towards late morning, the snow will get worse, that type of thing. It's being able to interpret the forecast and understand there's a range. And that yes, while there have been huge technological advances, we still are not quite as good as everyone wants us to be. And there's plenty more technological advances to come. Is there anything that you know, kind of in the wind and development, uh, technology wise that you're excited about? Anything so, that's on the verge? You know, people do hear a lot about computer models in terms of weather. A lot of people hear about the Euro and the American model. So there are actually several American models. One of them is called the GFS. So this is literally a taxpayer funded supercomputer that's spitting out a weather solution. It's taxpayer funded, so that's the key. There's another one, this Euro, that tends to be a little bit more reliable because it's run by Europeans where very much in their style of running things, you pay, each country pays annually to go in on this weather computing system. So the resources in terms of getting better computers and advancing them, it's much better. Here, as you would expect in Congress, there's haggling over money. After a big storm like Sandy, a lot of money got put into the computer models and our model got better. Then there's no major weather events for a couple of years. No one cares about weather again. We don't get as much money. There'll be another big storm. Everyone will freak out. Some more money will go in. It will get better. So the GFS actually still is undergoing some of those improvements that were funded after Sandy. It takes a while for them to work in. And the model has been getting better. It actually performed very well this week. But in addition to the computer modeling getting better, better satellites still. The resolution on the satellites is really incredible. And that's getting better and better, even for less sexy things, so to speak, not like looking at clouds, but things like soil moisture. You know, how mm -hmm. moist is the soil? That's really important when you talk about drought or the energy that can come from the land and be transferred to the atmosphere. It's not something that we're gonna show on TV and people are gonna think like, oh wow, that's really cool, like soil moisture. But it actually really makes a big difference in terms of, again, being able to come up with a better forecast. Great. Uh, so I think it would be great to uh, turn to some audience questions. Yeah, and sure. let's see. Um, here's one, uh, Martha Buick asked, phenology, tracking cyclical events in nature as Fearing Burr did and as Thoreau did has become newly important as scientists and volunteers are collecting evidence of climate change. I wonder whether you, Michael, track changes in dates for first snows or length of freezing weather periods, first frosts, uh, and whether these are in fact reflecting changes in climate. So th these actually, I would argue, are some of the most fascinating for me that you included, like when the pond freezes, when the birds arrived. That stuff is really, really fascinating. And again, those are things that people did all the time decades ago. And now a lot of us, not all, I mean, some, some of us are weird like me and <laughs> pay attention to when the first flower blooms in the garden or whatever. But it's really interesting. And going back to Blue Hill, where Bob Skilling, of course, worked for all those years full time, they keep track of things like that, when the pond freezes, when the first blueberry is ripe in the bushes. And it's really valuable information as we track climate, because those are early indicators that 
are most definitely shifting. And it's very easy for people to resonate with seeing seasonal shifts and seeing how our seasons are changing because of climate change. So those were important then, they're still very important now, no question. And they definitely are useful in the conversation about climate change as things warm up. There's a lot of scientific research to show that here in New England, South Shore, our seasons are shifting. For example, summer has moved a little later. So now like September is almost a summertime month. Fall has shifted later. And as a result, winter has shifted later into spring. Spring is coming a little bit later. So everything's moved on the calendar a little bit. And those are the type things that you see reflected in first frost, first freeze, when we're seeing the first blooms. And, you know, talking about blooms or things like that, we care because if you're getting you know, difference in bloom and you have a frost cycle that's different, that's a huge implication for agriculture. You know, if you have things coming out when it's too early, you can have a lot of damage to things like the apple crop. We lost a whole peach crop in Southeastern Mass a couple years ago because everything bloomed too early. Then we had a sudden cold snap and the whole crop was wiped out. So, you know, these have real world implications. Hopefully that kind yeah. of answers the question. Yeah. This is kind of a related question, but maybe you can add something. The question is, do you think that global warming will make weather prediction harder, even with the improved technology, because of the different patterns? I don't know that it will make it harder because our technology really, it makes a big difference. Um, I think we'll be able to see it coming. I think people will just be surprised at how often we're tracking big storms. And this is a great example, like this storm, you can never take one example. Like one of my pet peeves working in media is how things get broad brushed. Like there's so much nuance in everything. You can't point at a hurricane or this blizzard and be like, oh, that was climate change. This blizzard probably would have happened no matter what, but we do know that climate change is making it easier for blizzards like this to happen more frequently. So, you know, you look back at now the top 10 storms in Boston, a lot of them are in the past couple of years, even though the world is warming, there's more energy in the ocean, for example, which is staying warmer later, that energy can be transferred to the atmosphere and you're juicing up these storms to produce a lot of snow. All of that is very much related. So I wouldn't be so concerned about making it more challenging to forecast. I just think it's going to be really key that we as meteorologists do a good job of conveying the significance of these things and that when they do happen, there will be a lot of impact to human life. And that's what we have to get better at is what does this mean for daily life? It doesn't matter if it's one inch of rain or two inch of rain for most people. You know, some people care about that. Sure. If you're a, a water resources manager or something, but the average Joe needs to know, is something going to flood? Is it not going to flood? Should I drive? Should I not drive? Those are the things we need to communicate as these events become more common. Here's a question that really relates to impact of weather on business or industry. Uh, Dave Anderson asked, do you have any insights on the cargo shipping industry and their plans when there are storms like yesterday? The radar showed yesterday's storm is covering a major amount of the Atlantic from the U.S. up past Canada. Do you think ships were in that storm? or did this they actually, ship? Yeah, this is a great question. I, um, I worked with Business Insider a couple months ago on a project, not in the Atlantic, but in the Pacific, because there was a huge increase in cargo loss over the pandemic and into the early part of this year. So some of that is because ships were trying to get caught up. They're putting more cargo on the ships. Like I said, as usual, there's no just broad brush answer to any of this, it's nuanced. So part of it is that, but the other real part of it is just as I was talking about in the Atlantic with this storm, you have oceans that are staying warmer, longer into winter. So they have more energy and it's making it easier for very intense storms to develop. So just like with this one and other storms up and down the Eastern seaboard in the Pacific, we have a lot of these bomb cyclones, another media term, just kind of a dumbed down way to say bombogenesis, a term that's existed forever in weather, but it's making it easier for this process of rapid intensification to occur. And when that happens, you're getting lower pressure in the storm, which generates bigger waves, stronger winds, and can lead to more cargo loss. So that's a real concern for these companies. And there's a lot of investment in companies like this or over land in terms of weather research of how they avoid the storms, how they plan for it, reroute around it. That's where weather actually gets really fascinating, like business applications. You know, when you know what your business needs for all of these different things, 
to plan accordingly and, and to put the research into exactly what you need. So um, my guess is that the cargo ships probably drove through that storm in most cases, the one yesterday, because it was so quick. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it was a fast mover, but some of the ones in the Pacific definitely have caused a lot of problem, a lot of cargo loss, and it has changed how cargo operation runs from Asia to the Western part of North America. Yeah, well, while we're waiting for more audience questions, uh, one of the things that, that uh, your answers provoke is that there must be a, a lot of different career paths that are opening up or that are growing because of investment in technology, uh, new kinds of science and math, math, uh, math models, et cetera, that are being applied to weather the understanding of how it impacts business. Uh, if you were going to give a young person uh, advice, aside from going into meteorology, what are all these other fields that might be really growing right now? There, there really are a ton. Um, and a lot of them do have an implication for business. So obviously I went into media. TV isn't what it used to be in terms of a platform. You know, people are getting more of their information online from social media. You can connect with meteorologists there. But on the business side, there's a ton of growth. So weather risk management, that could be anything from forecasting temperature outlooks for natural gas and oil consumption. You're looking weeks and weeks out. So companies know what type of allocation and demand they're going to need. Could be like Mars Candy Company heavily uses meteorologists, again, trying to get sugar from place to place, making sure there's no disruption to supply chain. Airlines, of course, are huge into weather. There was very strong jet stream a couple of weeks ago. Again, those prevailing winds where some airlines were dramatically rerouting their planes to avoid the strongest winds or they had to make additional stops to refuel. So whether it's stock trading and you're trying to make money on oil futures or something like that, day-to-day -day logistical operations, or you're doing research for these companies that are shipping things across the Pacific and Atlantic, there are a lot of business applications for weather. And that's increasingly where customers and companies are demanding a lot of investment. They're realizing that if you invest in weather, you can fix a lot of problems or you can make the problems less problematic. So I think most people going into meteorology these days are following one of those paths instead of going into TV. There's actually, it's you want a job in TV right now, it's actually very easy to find one in local news because they're having a hard time getting people to take those jobs kind of bad hours and, you know, kind of, kind of a dying sector of the field. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so this question, I guess, is more for, for me and, and I don't have a, an exact answer for you, Nancy McDonald. Uh, she asks where the custom house was in Hingham. I, I believe it was somewhere uh, along the uh, harbor where all the wharves were. There was a lot of shipping going on in those days in the 19th century, in and out of, of Hingham. Uh, there were these packets, uh, type of, of ship that would actually be used for selling merchandise in Boston that came out of there. Um, and then all kinds of uh, in and out of lumber, uh, et cetera. So um, I believe it was along that, that inner harbor coastline. I could do a little research and, and uh, find out for you, Nancy, but. Uh, somewhere in that vicinity. Okay, any other questions for Michael? Well, if not, uh, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today to, to talk about weather forecasting, uh, so many other things that tie in with it. And thanks to our attentive audience, some great questions. Uh, before we close, I have two quick announcements. First, our next program in the Out of the Box series is scheduled for February 27th, and it will feature Joel Bowie, who some of you may have seen as a military expert on Antiques Roadshow. Joel is going to be examining and commenting on pieces in the Hingham Historical Society military collection, which is actually a much broader range of materials than you might expect. So that should be a lot of fun. And also, uh, if you have time this afternoon and want to chat among your friends in the audience, we will be having a post-program Zoom, which will start in a couple of minutes. And while our program was underway today, you got a separate Zoom evite with a link to join that program. And I hope to see uh, many of you on that so we can uh, share our stories about yesterday, perhaps. But Michael, thank you so much again. And uh, if you have time, you're welcome to join the post-Zoom program as well. Wait, I think there's one more question coming in. 
Can we just see quick? All right. Oh, it's just a thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Like <laughs> always, always like talking about the weather. Lots of fun yeah, things. About yeah, it's great. All right. Thanks so much. And with that, I will say good afternoon and see you on our post-program Zoom. Thank you.